Okay, we're going to start uh, 120 with numbers today. These are just some sentences with different expressions of numbers. On the record, the author wrote 87 short stories, 43 plays, and 8 novels. The 10 year old wanted to go to the movies with her two older sisters. The second and third prize winners did not receive trophies. Class starts promptly at eight. Dinner is served at seven sharp. So don't be late. School is out at four o'clock. The library opens at eight o'clock. His appointment was for 1.30 in the afternoon. I'll be home by 6.45. I catch the bus at 7.30 a.m. every morning. They should both be home by 8.15 p.m. Monday, Tuesday, and Friday are the days our office is open, 8 to 5.30 p.m. The 70-year-old woman always took her six cats and seven dogs for a walk on Sunday. The fourth quarter of the fiscal year runs through June, July, and August. We try to spend a week with the folks every February or March and November. My sister was born on Tuesday, January 17, 1977. April and May were warmer in 90 than in 89. The pies were divided into 12s, and each person had at least one piece. The 1960s has proved to be an extremely influential decade. The infant was only eight and one half months old. The world population has risen from approximately 4.5 billion in the early 1980s to 5.5 billion <clears throat> in the early 1990s. The Tokyo metropolitan area has 27 million people. Mexico City, 23. New York, 14. Los Angeles, 10. Cairo, 8.9. Tehran, 9.3. London, 9. Paris, 8.7. Two thirds of the group visited the museum, while the remaining 33% went to the theater. On March 14, 1989, the Exxon Valdez ran aground, releasing 240,000 barrels of oil 
into Prince William Sound. There were some 4,000 odd people at the celebration. I think $50 is too much for this product. In 1991, some average per pound food prices in the U.S. included bread, 70.5% um, cents, eggs, $1.10, chicken, 89 cents, and ground beef, $1.65. There were 5,982 people at the football game. The well-produced 7,695 barrels of oil every four hours In November, we traveled 3,000 miles on our vacation and spent two weeks sightseeing. In 1991, there were 773,000 college and university teachers, 457,000 men and 316,000 women. Also sometimes tricky is doing your alphabets. Do you have a problem with that? Like acronyms? Yeah. Uh, let's do a few of those sentences. If you don't learn your ABCs, you'll never amount to anything. In addition to being a member of NCRA, and FCRA, she has passed the CSR, RPR, and CM exams. The headquarters for both the CIA and the FBI are located in or near Washington, D.C., the capital of the USA. We were quite saddened when we learned that the daughter of a friend of ours had OD'd on LSD. The MOs of both crimes were almost identical. The Plains ETA is 5.50 p.m. EST. I had never seen so many VIPs at one time. Before moving west and joining the LAPT, LAPD, he was an officer with the NYPD for nine years. Okay. Okay, we're going to do some straight matter now. This will be for readbacks, so it's going to be a little bit slower. On the record, Mr. Speaker, I would like to follow up the comments made by Mr. Marshall. The data that I would like to present 
in today's session has to do with the armed forces that protect the people of the United States of America. The armed forces exists for two specific reasons. First, to protect the interest of the American people in foreign lands. And second, to defend the nation if international conflict or war should arise. The most urgent challenge facing today's armed forces is twofold. We must continue to man both the active sector of the military forces and at the same time maintain a strong group of people in the military reserves. We must continue to strive to attract and retain qualified men and women in both active and non-active duty positions. Our country also needs highly skilled individuals in the civilian workforce to support the needs of the military. Okay, take it away. Mr. Speaker, I would like to follow up the comments made by Mr. Marshall. The data that I would like to present in today's service. No R. Service? Session. Oh. Do you have a shun? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Session has to do with the armed forces that protect the people of the United States of America. The armed forces exist for two specific reasons. First, to protect the interest of the American people in foreign lands, and second, to defend the nation if international conflict of war should arise. The most urgent It's probably a brief KH challenge. Oh, challenge faces facing facing today is armed forces. Oh, I'm going to stop it there. Facing it's today's, today's. not today is. Oh, yeah. Okay. Today's armed forces is twofold. We must continue to read continue to man both the active sector of the military forces and at the same time maintain a strong group of people in the military reserves. We must, no, yeah, we must continue to, to prove, to strive, to strive to No. Attract? Attract and retain qualified men and women in both active and non-active duty, duty positions are country. Our country also needs highly skilled individuals in the civilian workforce to support needs of the military. The needs of the military. Okay, good. Okay, we're going to repeat that and go on now. In the record. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker. I would like to follow up the comments made by Mr. Marshall. The data that I would like to present in today's session has to do with the armed forces that protect the people of the 
United States of America. The armed forces exist for two specific reasons. First, to protect the interest of the American people in foreign lands, and second, to defend the nation if international conflict or war should arise. The most urgent challenge facing today's armed forces is twofold. We must continue to man both the active sector of the military forces and at the same time maintain a strong group of people in the military reserves. We must continue to strive to attract and retain qualified men and women in both active and non-active duty positions. Our country also needs highly skilled individuals in the civilian workforce to support the needs of the military. It is time to get serious about the manpower problem that the military faces. The manpower deficiency is viewed as one of the most serious weaknesses in today's armed forces. During the last 10 years, the armed forces of America has seen a downward spiral in the number of men and women enlisting for active duty. Enlistments are down, which means that manpower is down. Our country cannot continue to function as a world military power with an inadequate number of personnel in the armed forces. The all-volunteer armed forces has been a failure from everyone's point of view. My fellow colleagues who have worked on this issue with me in committee feel that we cannot continue to let this problem languish and fall by the wayside. We must act today. The all-volunteer armed forces creates a serious setback for national security and national defense. We are vulnerable as a nation. Solutions to this problem are on the horizon. Congress has approved some progressive initiatives that will attract some new bodies and new blood into the armed forces. These initiatives include the following. One, reinstatement of the guaranteed education package. Enlisted men and women would be eligible for free education during their military career. They would be eligible for on-the-job training programs to develop vocational skills and trades. Men and women in the armed forces would be eligible for some of the benefits offered to veterans, including subsidized educational programs and low-cost government loans for housing. Two, a more generous retirement program would be made available to individuals who have served 10 years, 15 years, and 20 years. Retirement packages would include free health care for life and a more generous retirement income based on years of service. Three, a greater opportunity for service in a foreign country of their choice. Length of stays in foreign bases would be subject to renewal for up to four years of service in a foreign country of their choice. Mr. Speaker, a starting point for a stronger armed forces is that Congress and the President must demonstrate a consistent commitment to the people of the United States of America to upgrade the armed forces. It must be recognized by all of the members of this chamber 
that without such a commitment, no real and lasting improvements can be made to stabilize and revitalize the armed forces of the USA. You know what I want to do? I want to leave time at the end so that we can, um, I thought maybe you had your computer with you. I have it. You do? I have it. Okay. I'm going to see if we can um, have you set up, it, it should just take a couple of minutes literally to set up a, a Zoom account, a free okay. account, and then I can literally go on my phone and I want to see if it's going to, um, how, I want to know how I should com connect with you also. So. Okay, I'm going to break this down now. AJ, some one minute pushes out of this. So these will be just a tad faster. Hang on to as many words as you can, and then I'll pause after a minute. Mr. Speaker, I would like to follow up the comments made by Mr. Marshall. The data that I would like to present in today's session has to do with the armed forces that protect the people of the United States of America. The armed forces exist for two specific reasons. First, to protect the interest of the American people in foreign lands, and second, to defend the nation if international conflict or war should arise. The most urgent challenge facing today's armed forces is twofold. We must continue to man both the active sector of the military forces and at the same time, maintain a strong group of people in the military reserves. We must continue to strive to attract and retain qualified men and women in both active and non-active duty positions. Another one. Our country also needs highly skilled individuals in the civilian workforce to support the needs of the military. It is time to get serious about the manpower problem that the military faces. The manpower deficiency is viewed as one of the most serious weaknesses in today's armed forces. During the last 10 years, the Armed Forces of America has seen a downward spiral in the number of men and women enlisting for active duty. Enlistments are down, which means that manpower is down. Our country cannot continue to function as a world military power with an inadequate number of personnel in the Armed Forces. The all-volunteer armed forces has been a failure from everyone's point of view. My fellow colleagues who have worked on this issue with me in committee feel that we cannot continue to let this problem languish and fall by the wayside. We must act today. The all-volunteer armed forces creates a serious setback. Okay, next one. We are vulnerable as a nation. Solutions to this problem are on the horizon. Congress has approved some progressive initiatives that will attract some new bodies and new blood into the armed forces. These initiatives include the following. One, reinstatement of the guaranteed education package enlisted men and women would be eligible for free education during their military career. They would be eligible for on-the-job training programs to develop vocational skills and trades. Men and women in the armed forces would be eligible for some of the benefits offered to veterans including subsidized educational programs and low-cost government loans for housing. And one more. Two, 
a more generous retirement program would be made available to individuals who have served 10 years, 15 years, and 20 years. Retirement packages would include free health care for life and a more generous retirement income based on years of service. Three, a greater opportunity for service in a foreign country of their choice. Length of stays in foreign bases would be subject to renewal for up to four years of service in a foreign country of their choice. Mr. Speaker, a starting point for a stronger armed forces is that Congress and the President must demonstrate a consistent commitment to the people of the United States of America to upgrade the armed forces. It must be recognized by all of the members of this chamber that without such a commitment, no real and lasting improvements can be made to stabilize and revitalize the armed forces of the USA. Okay, I think we're going to do a little bit of jury charge and then we'll start things. Okay. Do you brief uh, prudent person? Mm -hmm. Proximate cause? Mm -hmm. Contributory negligence? Mm -hmm. Under the circumstances? UTS. Oh. Under all the circumstances, ULTS. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's work on this one now. On the record. Members of the jury, an action of this kind is based upon a claim that the defendant has been negligent. Negligence is the failure to use the care and caution which a reasonably prudent person would exercise under the circumstances. The reason that the plaintiff cannot recover without proving negligence on the part of the defendant is that the law says that just because an accident occurred that there is no automatic proof that the defendant has been negligent. This is a matter which you would have to find from the facts because, in other words, the law holds that there shall be no recovery if that particular person was himself in any way responsible for the accident. This is what is called contributory negligence. If any negligence on the part of the plaintiff contributed to the happening of the accident, there can be no recovery. The plaintiff suffered injuries and damages as a result of the accident. The law presumes that he was a careful person and not negligent. It is essential, therefore, for the defendant to prove contributory negligence on the part of the plaintiff. This will be one of the questions you will have to take into consideration in deciding the facts. It is your duty to determine the facts. It is your duty to reconcile the testimony as far as you can, bearing in mind the fact that no two persons remember a thing in exactly the same way. Also, bear in mind that there is apt to be a little confusion on the part of the witnesses who are inexperienced in the courtroom when they get on the witness stand. Therefore, you may see minor differences appear in the testimony of the witnesses. Ladies and gentlemen, you should take all these facts into consideration in passing upon the facts and you will use your best judgment as to who has been telling you the truth. You must pass upon the credibility of the witnesses. When you do that, you may take into consideration their interest in the outcome of the case, if any. This is what we call an interested witness. 
you will scrutinize with care the testimony of an interested witness and if you believe that such a witness because of interest has testified falsely you have the right if you choose to disregard the entire testimony of such a witness of course bear in mind that an interested witness may be just as truthful as a disinterested witness so too if you believe that a witness has willfully testified falsely as to a material fact you have a right to disregard all the testimony of such a witness and you must disregard the testimony which you think is false your verdict must be unanimous and you take your instructions as to the law from me but you are the proper persons to determine just what happened in this case members of the jury i have instructed you the burden of proof is upon the plaintiff to prove by a preponderance of the evidence that the defendant was negligent you must also determine that the negligence was a proximate cause of the injuries alleged to have been sustained by the plaintiff in every negligence case there are two questions to be answered and there are two facts that must be proved in order to establish any evidence of negligence on the part of the defendant the plaintiff must prove first that the defendant was guilty of negligence and secondly that the plaintiff was free from negligence contributing thereto it is very proper that the law should not recover for injuries which the plaintiff himself has been instrumental in bringing about okay we're going to start some takes now